things we're going to do this morning at the end of our service here is we're having a baby dedication. So if you're prepared as a parent to come, be a part of our baby dedication. You have any other relatives with you, bring them up here as well, line up here. Uh, you know, Believers Fellowship, we believe the importance of our, our children and, and committing our children to the Lord. And uh, I get to wear the hat though, okay? That one. <laughs> <laughs> you want your hat back? Can I have it? Can I have it? You sport it better than I do. Any other parents here that would like to, and grandparents as well, you come be a part of this time. And maybe you didn't know about it, but you'd like to be a part of this time. And you can get announced, but you know, you've been waiting for the opportunity to come dedicate your child or your, your infant. Come at this time. You know, we, we believe that children are heritage of the Lord, is, is exactly as the scripture says. And you know, that they're gifts from God to us. And we're, we're responsible as parents and grandparents to, to the admonition and to the nurturing and to the raising of our children in, in a godly home, in a godly environment. The Bible says you train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's older, he will not depart from that. And a lot of times we don't, we don't understand that completely. But the way that he should go means it's the God way, the Jesus way. And I believe it's even specific in talking about that of... of uh, uniquely to where your children are. God, you, you're the parents and grandparents. You love this child. God's going to give you insights to their life and, you know, things about them that they don't know yet. <laughs> All right? And so it's important as parents that we do that. So with baby dedication, really, we have family and parent dedication as well. And we commit our children to the Lord, but we also commit our parents to the Lord that they would be, you know, the kind of parents that God calls them to be and fulfill that godly role that God's given them. It's, a, it's an... It's an unbelievable responsibility you know they don't come with manuals did you get one to the hospital to give you a manual yeah. they didn't even tell me how to change the diaper you know so that, that, was, that was pretty quick come on Bo you're just dragging your feet get up here <laughs> but children you know uh, we'd had a house full at my house if the Lord would have allowed it amen so we love kids and our church loves kids and so we want to we want to Pray for these parents, and especially for these children. We also have a gift of a Bible we'll give to the, to the children. Stacy will give it to you for the service. Out of, in just a moment, even, she'll present that to you. But uh, uh, in fact, we have an assignment in the service as well for, for everybody so your children can participate to read Romans chapter 6. So make sure they read it. And uh, got Romans 6, you got that? Good. And, yeah, you, you have to read it, Mom. So that was a lot. So let's pray for them. And I, I'd encourage you as parents who've raised perhaps children, you know the, the grace that's needed. So let's just pray for these folks. And Lord, as we come and lay our hands on these children today, we do so in faith. And we want to commit them to you and to Jesus. And Lord, I ask you to touch their hearts and their lives. And that, Lord, each child would sense your presence, Lord, in their home for these parents, that they would just be filled with your spirit. Lord, that you would give them the supernatural insight to these children so that they could train in the way that you have desired for each one of these children. So guide these parents and these grandparents and these relatives, brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles, Lord, that they would walk with a, a unique discernment that you give to them to be the difference maker in these lives that you've placed in their hands. We believe that these kids are on loan from you. They're, they're ultimately your children. And we want to be, handle them responsibly before you, that you'd be glorified. So, Father, that means that our hearts need to be right as well as leading them in the right path as well. So move and minister in these families in a way that will bring you the most glory and the most honor. We don't know what you have planned for these, these lives, but you do. You have a purpose already etched out in heaven. Help them to discover that, not only the child, but the parents to, to see it in advance, prepare their child for it. In Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. 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 Give these guys a great hand. Praise the Lord. You can be seated. God bless you. You got to love babies. Amen. And the hat. <laughs> Plural. I'm going to tell you something today. Listen carefully. I'm going to tell you something today that will literally change your life. I'm serious. I put money on it. <laughs> that if you'll receive this and you'll believe this, and it's from the Bible, and I made up, all right? I'm not smart enough to do that. That if you'll receive this from the Word of God, as we look at the Word of God, it will literally transform your life. And I know some of you wives are telling your husband, listen, honey, listen. <laughs> but I'm, I, I mean this with all my heart. I'm going to give you 
You know, we're in our series on, on breaking free and, and discovering the freedom that's yours in Christ. And, and this is part three in the series, and the, and the subtitle is, Who Do You Think You Are? <laughs> yeah, but your mama ever said, Who do you think you are? Well, you should know I came from you, mom. I mean, it's your fault. <laughs> Who do you think you are? And it's an important in understanding that, and that by that, I mean, there is a biblical description of just exactly who you are. But if you don't know that, you're going to live completely different. Everybody lives with a perceived self-image. I mean, what you think of yourself is how you live your life. It's impossible to live any other way than how you perceive yourself. Now, the world's kind of caught a little bit of this understanding, and so they try to convince you of something about yourself that's probably not even true. You know, they try to tell you all these things through positive self-visualization and imagination of all these things about you. That, that's why in, in school now everybody gets a trophy and everybody gets a ribbon and, you know, you're, you know uh, and, and they try to give you a perceived image of yourself. Now, that doesn't mean anything. What really makes a difference is who you really are. Every one of the temptations of Jesus Christ, the three temptations that are mentioned in the book of Matthew, the devil comes to Jesus and says, oh, if you really are who you say you are. That's pretty much what it is. If you are the Son of God. Now, understand, Jesus had no trouble knowing who he was. I mean, even at the age of 12, he told his parents, you knew I had to be about my father's business. All right? He had no problem with knowing exactly who he was. The problem is that Christians don't know who they are. I am not who I used to be prior to a certain cataclysmic, supernatural, cosmic event that took place in my life. I got saved. And if you got saved, well, mine wasn't so, yes, it was. If you got saved, it was a supernatural event that took place in your life. Now, in knowing that, you understand that God made you different. You're not who you are used to be. You're, you're a different person entirely. And I want to give you about six things about you today that you need to understand. The, these are not from me. This is what the Bible says about you. And if you can embrace these six things, begin to really believe them, claim them as truth in your own life, I believe your life will be changed. And I'm talking about from the most mature believer in here to the most immature believer in here. Your life can be different. And all too often we live with this perception of ourselves that's just not biblical. Nothing is more foundational to your freedom from Satan's bondage than understanding and affirming what God has done for you through Christ and who you are as a result of what he's done through Christ for you. And if you can just get a hold of that and say, well, what does that mean for me? What, what has God done for me? It, how does that really affect my life? Because if you just look at your life through, well, whatever you've been told or what you've perhaps thought up on your own about yourself, then you are of all people most miserable. Amen? Because the Bible makes some, some, some bold statements about who you are. Now, again, the world comes up with something, but most of what they're coming up with is usually a train wreck and not based upon reality. But with this Christian, this is not what you can imagine yourself to be and visualize myself to be these things. This is a reality. This, this is done. You just, you just hadn't seen it yet. It, it, it's like, you know, have you ever gone to the restaurant and you're getting ready to pay for your meal and somebody paid for you? Man, if you'd have known that in advance, you'd enjoyed it a lot more, wouldn't you? <laughs> well, somebody's already paid for all this. It's already been done. You can enjoy the meal, all right? And this is exactly where Satan is going to attack you. And if you perceive yourself in life as some kind of, I'm just trying to get through. I know what the Bible says. I'm kind of a helpless victim caught in this battle of Satan and demons and God and angels, you know. And, you know, I, 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 you're going to live in, like a victim and you're going to live in bondage to the lies of Satan most of your life. But on the other hand, if you can somehow get a grip on the fact that you are a dearly loved, special prize in the heart of God, you are his child. That God loved you so much, he sent his only begotten son, he redeemed you. When you were not redeemed, Anyway, worth redeeming. He loved you in spite of yourself. If you're looking for in some kind of search for significance, you can discover it in Jesus Christ. That you are unique in him and your life has been changed in him. You, you're, you're accepted. You don't have to prove anything to him. All right? You have to watch, well, I guess God's disappointed in me. No, he's not. He, he knows your makeup. He knows who you are. But what you need to see at this point is that I'm accepted in the beloved. The scripture says God receives me. And God loved me. 
God sent his son to die for me. That, that, that's a starting point right there. And it's not based upon my value. It's based upon him and how glorious and wonderful and great and loving he is. Somehow we get all this twisted around. So let me give you some things and, you know, there'll be a test afterwards to so write these down. Oh, chill out. That was just a joke. <laughs> Number one, you are eternally alive and well. You are eternally, well, I don't feel like I'm alive and well. I've got a little arthritis. <laughs> I've got a little pain. No, we're talking about it. You are eternally alive. Well, there's nothing the devil can do about that. If you know Christ, if Jesus lives in you, you are already eternally alive and well. Satan can't change your position. He can't move you out of the hands of God. There's nothing he can do. You, you can't see yourself as some kind of, as we said, a victim kind of caught in the middle of a tug of war. Like on one side is the devil, you know, and, and his demons are all pulling on the other side. is God. He said, pull, boys, the angels, you know. It's going to win, you know. Or, the, or you've seen the little Hollywood characterization of the demon on one corner and the little angels and, and the angels with their wings on the other side, you know, and, and she is a demon and you as an angel, whatever. You're, you're not caught in some kind of spiritual tug of war. The war has already been settled. You have some decisions to make. You have a choice to make, all right? You, you can get on board or be miserable. You can understand what the Bible says or, or, or you can be ignorant. And if you'll choose to find out what the Bible says and believe that, then you can start living in freedom. You're, you're comprised, and we talked about this a multitude of times, so I won't spend a lot of time here, of body, soul, and spirit, right? With your body, you know, you, you, you relate to, to the world in a physical way. With your, with your soul, it's mind, and will, and emotions, you relate on that level with the spirit. Well, that's where you relate to God at. Before you meet Jesus Christ, you're dead there, all right? The Bible says we are dead in our trespasses. And what does that mean? It means that in your spirit, you're dead. There's no life there. But when you come to Christ, well, Jesus used the terminology very clearly. You are born again. You've been born once in a fleshly life, and that's flesh, but now you have a different life. You've been now made alive spiritually. When Adam sinned in the garden, we know that spiritual death entered in. The Bible says death came upon all men. But when God created Adam, he was alive totally. Body, soul, and spirit. Sin entered in, spirit's dead. And all men are born this way with a dead death in their life, death in their spirit, until Jesus Christ comes in and by the Holy Spirit, he makes you alive spiritually. I told you before, I wrote a track years ago called I've Been Possessed by an Alien Being. You know, because the Bible says we're aliens... We're, 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 we're foreigners to God. We're separated from the life of God and from the vine and from the blessings of God. But when we come to Christ, we're brought in. And now, you know, now we're aliens to the world. But now I am, I, I'm eternally alive in Christ Jesus. And contrary to what anything the devil can tell me, he can't steal it. He can't take it. It's, it's already done. I'm alive in Jesus Christ. Hebrews 13, the, the apostle's writing, I believe, the, the Paul, but it's always up for debate. But he says here, let your lifestyle or your conversation be without covetous and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, no, why should I be content? Because I have this promise from God Almighty. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Well, what does that have to do with contentment? Everything. Then I don't have to think that my life is found in getting more something else or something bigger. It doesn't matter if everything goes and I lose it all. I have him and he's everything. That's why we sing and, and we understand that Jesus at the center of my life is what life is all about. It's not like he's first or even second. It's he's center. That my life's like a wheel turning on the hub. He's at the center of my life. And out of that, I have life. A person who doesn't know Christ personally that hasn't yet experienced what spiritual life really is. For those who do know Christ, hey, he'll never leave. He'll never forsake. There's times I try to leave and times I try to forsake, but he'll never leave. He'll never forsake. I am eternally alive and well. How you doing, Brother Joe? Alive and well. How's it going? Alive and well. What's going on? Alive and well. But what about that? I'm still alive and well. I heard you were sick. Yeah, but I'm alive and well. <laughs> Forever and ever and ever and ever. Why? Because he never leaves me nor forsakes me. Truth number one, some people still have trouble. They still, you're trying to, you're not really sure that God's even received you. Because, well, I'm not a very pretty person. And I haven't done very many nice things. 
It's not received on the basis of your merit, is it? It's grace, right? So you are accepted in the beloved. In Christ, you're accepted. Now, second point is this, and we've dealt with this to some point, but let's, let's deal with it again. You are changed from sinner to saint. In other words, he says in Ephesians, you were dead, now you're alive. You were dead in your trespasses. You, you, your spirit was dead. You were dead in your sins. But when you gave your life to Jesus, he says, you have he, I love this King James word, he's quickened you. Quickened. I mean, just automatically, supernaturally, suddenly, by the grace of God, wham, pow, I'm alive. In that moment of repentance and faith, life comes in. And now, not only am I now eternally, forever and ever and ever, alive and well, I'm different. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that ought to be our anthem, amen. If any man's in Christ, he is a new creature. If any man's in Christ, any woman's in Christ, any person, they are a new creature. In other words, you're not what you used to be. You've been changed. Well, Brother John, I'm, kind of, I'm a sinner, but I'm saved by grace. That's not what the Bible says about you. It's true, but what it does say is you're a saint. A saint? Yeah, I'm a saint. Saint Joe. I'm thinking about getting a little medallion made. You can wear it. Put it on every morning. It won't do you any good. You just have a St. Joe medallion. <laughs> what are we saying here? It's not what the Catholic Church does. It's not what any denomination, abomination, or any theologian does. God said, I am now a saint. Someone who's unique to God himself. Special in God's sight, unique in God's sight. I belong to God. I don't belong to the world now. I don't belong to the devil. I'm a saint. I mean, just, just start telling your friends that, hey, I'm a saint. People tell you, well, he's just a saint. Hey, that's true. That's right. <laughs> I am. Not by my merit, not by my, 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 my beauty. I'm just, it's what God does. Now, it doesn't mean I don't sin. It doesn't make me sinless, but I do sinless. Put a little space in there. I do sin less. And the more I know him, the less I sin. The longer I know him, the less I sin. The more you know who you are in Christ, the less you sin. Because you begin to discover some of the things we're talking about here. But it's, it's just this self-deception that people live in, this self-perception that people live in, that causes them to live such a mediocre Christian life. People say, where does your enthusiasm come from? Well, where do you think it comes from? I don't get up and have a pep rally in the morning. Yeah, you know, hooray, Joe. Go, go, Joe. No, I got to celebrate Jesus. Enthusiasm in life comes from the one who is life, and, and it's Christ, and he's changed me, and I, I'm not what I used to be. I, I, you know, so many Christians, they just, well, I'm just hanging in there till the rapture. Well, the monkeys do that. <laughs> just hanging in there. I get all you, not, not, not what you, hey. Praise God, we aren't what we used to be. And we're not what we're going to be. But the journey doesn't have to be miserable. It doesn't have to be obnoxious and hard and so difficult as we I'm just trying to be, you know. The Bible doesn't refer to you even as a sinner saved by grace. It talks to that and it says that about us. But when it deals with who we are, it talks about us as saints and priests and kings and, you know, daughters of the king and children of the kingdom and light and salt and life. That's what the Bible says about you, and that's what the Bible says about me. So we are saints. And when did I become a saint? The moment I gave my life to Jesus. Theologically, the term is justification. God forgave me of every sin. That's, that's, that's glorious right there in the law, amen? Every sin, every, but every sin I ever will commit. The blood of Jesus provides forgiveness. I've been justified. You've heard the terminology, just as if I'd never sinned. Well, that's marvelous, but it's much deeper than that. You know, what if I sin tomorrow? The blood of Jesus is powerful. But we are to live as saints. Saved by the glorious power of God, we are saints in the kingdom of God, which leads at this point from our justification to our sanctification that I'm starting to be more like Jesus. It's not because I'm trying so hard. It's because I realize who I am. You know? There's a peach tree in my yard, and, you know, I've dealt with this tree before, and the squirrels, you know, they're always stealing stuff. But, you know, I was out there the other day, and I was mowing around that tree, and I looked at that peach tree, and there's just peaches popping up. You know, I thought, I wonder if that tree's groaning about that. Okay, I'm a peach tree. I'm supposed to put off peaches, so here goes. <laughs> hey, a peach. 
No, it's just pieces just popping out. Jesus said, if you abide in me, you'll bear fruit, bear much fruit. He didn't say if you grunt and groan, labor, pop a blood vessel, try real hard. I'm just trying hard, Pastor. No, it's just the nature of the tree to bear the fruit. It's the nature of Christians to enjoy this life that God's given us and to, 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 to live in it and to realize that God did something in us that made us so we don't have to sit there and, you know, pop a blood vessel. He's made us new creatures and new creations in Christ Jesus. So, hey, I'm eternally alive and well, and I am changed from sinner to saint. God has done this supernatural work in me. Ephesians 2, 5 says, even when we were dead in our sins, he brought us out of that. He made us alive. We're new creations. We're new creatures in Christ Jesus. I think if we could just take that one lesson today right there and just say, I'm going to believe that. God said that about me. I'll change, I believe that would change the very core of your self-identity. God's done something in me. I don't have to pretend to be a Christian. My mom used to tell me, act like a Christian. Lots of good reason for telling me that. One, because I was acting like a heathen. But mama, I was a heathen. You know? So, but when you get saved, I didn't have to act that part. It wasn't like an actor struggling over some role. I just, you know, sinners do what sinners do. But what happens when you get saved? Well, I'm going to be, begin to discover who I am. And guess what flows out of that? It's like the person said, well, I'm going to try to be a witness. No, you are a witness. Just be what you are. God made you a witness. God made you light. These light bulbs aren't struggling today. They're just putting off as a, as a reflection of the power that's in them. And we've been engineered pretty much the same way. We have God in us. And it's supposed to let him shine, not make him shine. God made me. Do you see the difference between me struggling along, trying to toil and labor so hard when God's already done this work in me? It's time for me to realize who I am and, and, and rejoice in that and be what God's called me to be. So I'm changed from sinner to state. In regard to that is, the change is here. You've been made a partaker of God's divine nature. One of my favorite passages in the Bible. I have a lot of them, but this is one of my favorite favorites, all right? Whereby are given us unto us exceeding great and precious promises. What does that mean? God gave you the word, all right? Exceeding great precious promises. But not only that, he says, he gave you this word so that by these promises... By the word of God, you might participate, be partakers in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. In other words, the only way you're going to not be that sinner saved by grace until going out and sinning all your life, is you're going to discover there's a new life in you. And the way you're going to live that new life is understanding the truth of who you are from the word of God. You have these promises. These promises... And you can understand them because you have this new nature. You can believe them because you have this new nature. They can be real in your life because you have this new nature. This new nature is that I'm participating is the very nature of God. God has come in, birthed me in my spirit, made me alive, and now inhabits my spirit. And we are one there. And now, you know, I have this new relationship. I said this cosmic event happened. God came in. Life came in. The Holy Spirit came in. And he gives me the capacity to understand what I read in the scripture. How many people say, oh, I just don't really understand the Bible. Well, first thing I would do is check to see, do I know Jesus? And then if I do know Jesus, I need to talk to the Father and say, Lord, I'm having a problem here. I need to understand this. So whatever's blocking the way, I need you to guide me and direct my heart because I want to participate in the life you have for me. I want to participate in the divine nature. I want you, God, to express your life in me. I want to enjoy you. I want to walk with you. I want to hear you. I want to live you. Participating in God's life. Participating in God's wholeness, participating in the fullness of God in your life. So when I got saved, all right, and now I'm eternally alive and well, and now I am this new person in Christ Jesus, I've been changed from sinner to saint, part of this new change is God inhabits me, and now he wants this, the, the expression of my Christian life is him living his life through me. Not me going out there and trying to perform for him. Boy, what a waste of time. I, I can't meet the standard. So you know what pleases him though is when he sees him coming through me and his life being expressed to me. I think this verse says it very clearly. When you give your life to Christ, you are changed in your very essence. I believe that. There's no other explanation for my life. <laughs> There's just no other explanation for it. I'm changed in my essence. 
And that's where life is going to be discovered. And I discover it as I discover his truth and his word. I was dead in my sins. I've been quickened now together with Christ. I've been saved by the grace of God. Before salvation, what was that? Well, the Bible refers to me in Romans as the old guy, the old man. <laughs> the old man. Why do they call him that old man? Because he's not the new man. He's old man. When I gave my life to Jesus, I became a new man. Put on a new life. The new man is inhabited by deity. All right? So before salvation, here's the old man. Romans 6 says, says, 6 says this, knowing this, that your old man is crucified with Jesus. Why? So that the body of sin, where this old man resides, this flesh, this sinful nature, that this body of sin might not, that, that we should, this body of sin might be destroyed and we should henceforth not serve sin. In other words, now because I'm a new person, even though there's the presence of this old nature, I don't have to submit to the power of the old nature. Did you get that? Even though it's resident, it ain't president. Who's president? Jesus. Old guy who was in office, Joe. In reality, when you study Romans 6, not even Joe, the devil. He's just manipulating Joe to think he was the president. But he wasn't even the vice president. He was the servant of sin. But what happened when I got saved? The shackles were broke. Yeah? And I don't have to serve sin anymore. I don't have to serve the old man anymore. Even though I may sense his presence there, when I gave my life to Christ, there was this new identity that I embraced now, this new life that I received. And being this new person doesn't mean that I'm without sin, but I don't have to sin. I remember preaching that in a good old East Texas church. The deacons met me at the door after I said this statement. You don't have to sin if you're a Christian. They didn't like that at all. What do you mean we don't have to sin? We have to sin. We're just sinners by nature. I said, well, I guess then you have to. <laughs> that's not who I am. Well, I'm just sinners saved by grace, so we're still sin. I said, well, yeah, that's because, well, that's because, you know, you choose that. How can you say we don't have to sin? Because we don't have to sin. That's how you say it. We don't have to sin. Well, then why do we? Because you want to. <laughs> Amen? Pretty simple. You want to. But he says here, the old man, the old nature can be destroyed. We, we can be in this process of putting him off and putting him away and, and wrecking him dead. You know? And he, in reality, he's dead to the power. We're dead. We don't have to do what the old nature tells us to do. And we don't have to do what the devil tells us to do. I would clap if I were you. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case that went over your head, we don't have to do what the devil tells us to do. And you'll flip wheels and say, the devil made me do it. Well, if you're a child of the devil, you have to do what the devil says. He's your daddy. But when you give your life to Christ, you have a new daddy. And you have to do what that daddy tells you to do now. But you don't have to sin. Now, being this new person doesn't mean that I will be that way because there's this growing process. Like I said, it's not that I, I'm sinless, but I begin to sin less. And if I do sin, First John says, I have an advocate with the Father, Amen. the Lord Jesus Christ. Because this really is a judicial issue we're talking about here, this thing about sin. There, there's a penalty, you know. If, if I'm giving from one campus on Sunday morning to another campus and I'm doing 80 miles an hour, there's a penalty for doing that. And they can pull me over and I legally have to pay the price for it. See, I have to pay the price for sin too or let Jesus pay it. Jesus paid the price for my sin. Now, we sin less because we know it offends God. We sin less because it's not part of our new life. We sin less because even though we seek to satisfy some desire of our flesh or the world, the devil, we're miserable after that. You know? How many of you just know you willfully chose to do something God told you not to do this week, and you did it anyway? Yeah, for whatever reason. Little lady, you're laying there in bed saying, oh, man, why did I do that? Why did I say that? Why did I go there? Why did I, why, why did I look at Why did I watch that? You're just kicking yourself. You didn't have to. But since you did, well, Jesus took your sin upon himself and he paid the price. And if you're willing to confess that sin to him and agree with him that that sin has been paid for and washed under the blood of Jesus, you can be forgiven because you have this lawyer, this advocate, his name is Jesus Christ, who stands before the judge who set this penalty in place and argues on your behalf in your case. And who is he? 
And who's his father? God. And who is he? He's the judge. So anytime I'm going to a court, I think I want the judge's son as my lawyer. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Don't you want the judge's son as your lawyer? Amen. Well, you have him in your behalf. So we come to God and we confess our sins. But here's what you need to understand. And part of this, this the idea of that now he's living in you and you have this new nature is you can be free because of this. You do not have to do what the flesh dictates. You do not have to do what the old desires would dictate, what the old, those things that you put in your life before, which you struggled with as a Christian, now you can say no to those things and have freedom in your life because you are a child of God. You, 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 you have this new relationship, it said in Romans 6, where now you're one with Christ. And it says, and Jesus Christ has died to sin, therefore, since you're one with him, you've died to sin. So when I come to Christ, I got this, this new life, and it's the Jesus life, and Jesus died to sin. So I'm, I'm connected, I'm united, I'm one with him, right? So guess what, what happened to me? I died to sin, because I'm now in Jesus Christ, which means that sin is, may be present, it may be calling, it may be whispering, it may be drawing, it may be appealing, but I don't have to do it because I have a new relationship that ended sin as my master, and I have a new master, and his name is Jesus. Amen. It doesn't terminate the existence of the sin. It doesn't terminate the existence of the temptation or even of my own flesh. Before I met Jesus, I was well trained in sin. I practiced a lot. <laughs> and so did you. Your habits, your attitudes, they were ingrained in you over and over, repetitive unbelief, repetitive bad behavior, repetitive thoughts. Somebody didn't treat you right, so you treat it because that's just the way you were. And by the way, I'm that way because my mama's that way. And her mama's that way and her papa was that way. So bless God, that's the way I am. You just have to like it or leave it. That's a sorry excuse for a Christian. That's a great excuse if you don't know Jesus. But you have a new lineage now. You can be like... Jesus. You can express his life. His grace can pour through you. Your death to sin ended the relationship with sin as your master. You have a new master. Now you don't have to do something just because you think of it. Just because it comes in your mind. Just because you feel this temptation to do it. There's the presence but the power has been terminated in Jesus Christ. Yeah, you still have some bad memories. You may have some bad pictures in your mind, some bad habits, conditioned responses to the way you react when people say something to you, things that prompt you maybe to focus in, in a situation or in traffic or in a relationship in your marriage that cause you to focus on your interest only. The appeal to sin is still there, but it's not in charge of your life. God has allowed you through Jesus Christ to establish a brand new relationship with sin in reality. And he says, now your new relationship to sin is that Jesus paid the price for it. It's forgiven. Jesus overcame the power of it, and now you can. Jesus deals with it in the past and the present and the future in my life and in your life as well if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord. So what do we do if we're participants in the divine nature and now we can be victorious, then what does the Bible say? That's how we live our life now. The Bible says this about me and my new life and my new relationship to God, and his word says this. So I find out what the Bible says, and guess what? I claim that. I receive. God, you said that, I, I take that. You said I'm free. You walk out of here, within five minutes, something hits you, you're tempted about it. You just look at it and say, hey, I am free in Jesus' name. The Bible says in Romans 6, that's exactly what Jesus did in temptation. The devil says, if you're the son of God, you do this. Jesus said, it is written. Basically, the Bible says, <laughs> Bible says, and he's quoted scripture. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. The problem is most Christians don't take any time with the Word of God, so they don't know what to claim, and they don't take any time with the Word of God, so they don't know what to believe, and they certainly don't know what to obey at that point. Give me a homework assignment. It's Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8. Just read it this week. Romans 6, 7, and 8. And I'll explain a bit more about the assignment in just a moment. But the key is believing what the Scripture has to say. Some of say, well, I'm just trying to die to sin. You already have. Now it's a matter of acting on what you know is the truth. Romans 6.11 says, Therefore we are dead to sin, but we are alive in Jesus Christ. 
Is that true? Oh, I'd like it to be. It is true whether you'd like it to be or not. I want it to be. It's still true. It'll be true in you when you decide to believe it. I've told you about my wonderful addiction to cigarettes and and at one part of my life. And by the way, I'm going to go a little long here, so settle down. We're not going to have an invitation. So this takes the place of the invitation. You'll get an assignment at the end, which you're all expected to do. I ain't coming back. Uh, This will bug you for another year, though. So (laughs) (laughs) I had that, you know, I I, I love smoking, all right? I had brothers that showed me how to smoke cigarettes, you know, at the ripe old age of six or seven, you know. By the time I was in junior high, I was smoking all the time. By high school, I was smoking all the time. When I got out of high school, I was, you know, smoking like a chimney. And I liked it. You know, any, any, any smokers here that say, yeah, I liked it too, I liked it. And some, some of you are still smoking. It's time to quit liking it, okay? But I liked it. And I smoke in the morning, smoke in the evening, smoke at supper time. <laughs> you, know? It just, oh, you know, it's just something to do with my hands. It, it, it was psychological as well as physical. The addiction was, the habits. You know, it, it, you stink, of course, you know, and you're always, you know, trying to get stuff. It, why do you do that? Because it stinks. You know it stinks, all right? So, you, you, and, I, and I loved it, though. You know, first thing in the morning, Marlboro. I thought I was the Marlboro man. You know? and, but when I gave my life to Jesus, God began to deal with me about that. He said, where in the Bible does it say smoking is a sin? There's no scripture verse that says Marlboro smoking is a sin. Or Cools or Kents or whatever generic version you buy or e-cigarettes or anything else. But it's pretty obvious, you know, if it ruins my testimony that it's not. God, God dealt with me about it, my heart. I was getting rid of a bunch of junk. I had drugs in the house and booze in the house, and I'm getting rid of all that stuff. Smoking a cigarette, praising the Lord, getting rid of all this stuff. Praise the Lord! Thank you, Jesus. You know, anyway. God just dealt with me at that moment, and I said, Okay. Because I, I said, Lord, I told you I wasn't going to play games with you. I, now that I gave my life to Jesus, it came out of my mouth, Lord, I'm not going to play games. I don't play church. I don't play religion. I, what you say here is true. That's what I desperately need in my life. And so, you know, he's taken advantage of me in that regard. <laughs> Pull me back up. This is what you said. I'm just taking you. You said this. So hold me accountable. But that's the way the Holy Spirit works in our life. I remember I wanted cigarettes for months and months, six, eight months, when I, almost a year by and by, I wanted a cigarette. You know. Did you smoke one? No, but I wanted one. You go to the restaurant, they say, would you like smoking or non-smoking? I'd say near smoking. <laughs> <sighs> it's not smoking. <laughs> you know? And then people told me about, they'd heard on radio that some guy had gotten pulled over and they pulled up, you know, as a, and they said this guy they knew had been, you know, he'd been in drugs, but they knew he hadn't been doing drugs and they pulled up the back seat of his car and found a bunch of drugs. I thought, oh, wow, I better pull up the back seat of my car. There might be stuff in there, you know. There's, there's been illegal merchandise in my vehicle before I met the Lord a lot of times. So I'm pulling everything apart, you know, and I'm, I pulled up the back seat and there's a brand new package of marbles, unopened. And in my mind, I'm saying, You know what else came in my mind? I'd put something else in my mind. I'd been memorizing Romans chapter 6 about a month before that. And what came in my mind at the same time that picture came in was another picture. And it was freedom in Christ. And looking the devil straight in the face and saying, I don't have to. Romans six fourteen, sin is no longer your master. That you should obey it. You know how freeing and glorious. And that's the last time I think I was really tr- troubled about this whole cigarette thing. That's probably the last time. I just looked at the devil and says, I don't have to. I'm free. But that's anything and everything from jealousy to pornography to immorality to adultery to homosexuality. Any and every sin. We don't have to. You choose to. We can be victorious. Which leads us to this, it gets down to this issue that's the power of sin. In Romans 7, Paul says, I'm saved, but I'm still dealing with this. Romans 6, remember, in 7 and 8, it's a letter. It was not broken down to chapters and verses till 3rd, 4th century, whatever it was, all right? For just for reference, it's a letter. 
And so there's not these different kind of thoughts where he said, well, I had this today, but I'm this tomorrow. He's saying, listen, we, we've been saved by grace through faith in Romans 5. In Romans chapter 6, we are in Christ now. We are new people. We don't have to do what the devil tells us to do. Now we can surrender our bodies as instruments of God's righteousness and serve him with our life. Verse chapter 7, oh, but man, I, yeah, there's a complication here. I know what the Bible says I am, but I'm not, I'm not behaving that way. He says, and, and gets down there and says, who's going to deliver me from this body of sin? Oh, wretched man that I am. I mean, we've all been there, right? I know what the Bible said, but I'm living like a wretched individual. I got this junk in my life. But see, he's taking you through. It doesn't stop there. And six years later, he writes Romans chapter 8. He's showing you the experience of this Christian life. You, there's this struggle we have to go through to realize that there's a war going on here. And that the old man was bound by certain laws and principles of sin and death. But now we're new in Christ and there's new things now that rule our life. I can get up on the building today, all right, at the peak of this point up here on the tallest part of the building and say, I'm going to fly. I believe I can fly. I believe I can touch the sky. Think about it now and jump off the building and kill myself. Because I can't fly. But you know what? If I go over to Hooks Airport and get in an airplane, I can fly. Because there's a law that is greater than the law of sin. There's a law that's greater than the law of gravity. It's called the law of aerodynamics. And that overrides the other law. Well, there's a law that's active in our life. Before we meet Christ, sin and death, it's operating. We must obey the flesh. We fall in sin. We try. We struggle. There's no victory. But now we discover that in Christ Jesus, we can have victory. And so we choose the new life in Christ and we find another law in operation, the law of the spirit and life in Christ Jesus that sets us free. And that's where Paul's going, who's going to deliver me? And he says, I thank God. Even before he, that chapter closes, all right? Remember, he didn't write it in chapters of verse. I thank God that through Christ this victory's won. There's a war with our flesh every day. There's a war with the enemy every day. There's a war with the world every day. We're in a battlefield, but there's a war going on, but we don't have to be victims in that war. We can be free, which leads me to the last point, and it's this. You can win this battle. It's all right here in the mind. That's where the battle is. It's here in your mind. Every temptation begins with a thought. A thought is interjected, whether it's the world appealing to you through some billboard or something on TV, whether it's your flesh that has an appetite for something that's contrary to the will of God, whether it's the devil himself, you can be free and you can win the battle that's going on in your mind. Look at this verse in the scriptures where it says, though we walk in this flesh, we have a physical, that's not where the war is. Where's the war? He says it's up here with imaginations and the thoughts take place. He said... The weapons of our warfare aren't carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now we think about battles. I mean, there's mighty weapons and there's strongholds and there's fortresses and there's refuges and all these imaginations that come to mind. No, he says, yeah, they're real, but they're here. So Satan wants to build a stronghold. What is that? Simply put, a, a, a demonic stronghold in a person's Christian's life is, is an idea that's contrary to what God has said. Like this. I can't do that. It's just too hard. It's contrary to what God said, though, isn't it? God said nothing's impossible, right? Well, I can't stop that. That's just who I am. No, what God says, God says you're a new person. That you don't have to submit your members as instruments of unrighteousness anymore, right? You know what God says? So what do I have to do? Every temptation, it all begins right here with what's in my mind. What am I going to do with these thoughts? Well, the Bible says simple. I'm not going to think that. I'm not going to think that. I'm not, no, that's not what it says. I mean, that was good. I'm not going to think of it. It's like, it's like standing in front of the refrigerator when you're on a diet. You know, poor Lenny, we were at the men's breakfast the other day, and he's sitting there with a little bag of Metafast chips. <laughs> Looking at all these breakfasts that were being brought out. There's moons over Miami, you know. And over here, there's a big slam, pancakes, and blueberry syrup, you know. And over here's something else. And he's really struggling to, to lose the weight. You know, most people doing that situation, we're, we're in that kind of deal, and we're looking at the moons over Miami, you know, and the big breakfast jack or whatever it is, and this breakfast skillet. My Lord, Aaron, after you ate that, were you okay? I mean, is he here this morning? I see he's not even here this morning, he, you know. <laughs> this, this breakfast skillet, you know. We sat there and we stared, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to open the refrigerator, I'm not going to open the refrigerator, I'm not going to open the refrigerator. And you know what happens? We open the refrigerator. Oh, that looks good. I think I'll eat that. That's not what the Bible says to do. It's not this middle mental battle I'm not going to do. The Bible says you take those thoughts and you give them to Jesus. No, who's, who, who's now the center of your thoughts? 
Jesus. Oh, I can't show those to Jesus. You know how ugly that is. He's omniscient. He knows already, okay? He knows what you're thinking right now, all right? So be careful. So you bring your thoughts to Jesus as bringing those thoughts into captivity. Yeah, I'm taking that thought about that food and I'm giving it to Jesus. Here's Jesus. Hey, how you doing, Lord? This is, where it's, this is what's going on in my mind right now, and I know it's contrary to what? It's contrary to the knowledge of God. This thing I'm dealing with here, it's not your will, is it? But what am I going to now focus on? I'm not focusing on that anymore now. Because what you focus on is what you're drawn to and what you will do. It's like, I'm not going to watch pornography. I'm not going to watch pornography. I'm not going to watch, going to watch pornography. Yes, you will. But what do you say, Lord? I know how wicked that is in your sight. And I love you more than that. And you've told me that I'm free from that. And I don't have to. So I want to thank you that I'm free from that. And I'm going to pull down those thoughts right now and I'm going to submit them and bring them to captivity to you because they exalt themselves against your knowledge. And I'm just going to bring it to your obedience. And now that's not the center of my thoughts. Now if I stay there, what's going to happen? I'll fall into it. But what becomes the center of my thought now? This new life, the new mind, the new hope, everything that I am in Jesus Christ. You know, when you get saved, all this junk's in there, isn't it? You know, I, I, was, I was messing with my phone the other day. My, I got the iPhone. Some of y'all have these phones. You ever notice if you look under setting, there's that factory reset? I asked God, why didn't I get one of those? <laughs> what it does, it puts you back to the manufacturer's specifications. He said, you did when you got saved. And now you just need to start responding to it. We have all this junk that's in here, past bad experiences. And every time I see somebody that looks like somebody, I'm mad out to get mad at them. You know, I come to church, and because I've had a bad experience with somebody else, somebody didn't shake my hand during the welcome time. And I walk away saying, what's the matter with them? Why didn't they shake my hand? And then I, then I go over and tell somebody else, you know, Frank, he didn't shake my hand. I wonder what's the matter with him. I think Frank's got a problem. <laughs> Maybe we ought to go pray for him. No, let's not do that. Let's just talk about him. <laughs> yeah, and that's the way, that's the way I, we just follow those old lines of behavior and, you know, the old tattoos. But I'll tell you what my daddy would do. My daddy would just punch him in the mouth. <laughs> I have a new daddy, too. <laughs> what would he do? Maybe Frank's hurting. Maybe Frank just got diagnosed with something the doctors told. You don't know about it. Yeah? But we're just all this. In my house, you know, there's, every time it rains, and the water was going through a certain way through my yard. Just automatically, the way the drainage was, and you get what's called erosion, right? We have this mental erosion that every time thoughts come raining in, they just follow the same course every time. How do you heal that? The Bible says, Jesus said, now you are healed through the words that I've spoken to you. How do we participate in the divine nature? Through the words that he's given us. We start filling our heart, we fill our life, we fill our mind with the Word of God. Because the Bible tells us that's where our freedom is. Two last scriptures here, 2 Corinthians 11. He said, listen, Satan has beguiled you like he did Eve. That's why I'm afraid for you. Satan's beguiled you. That's his goal. He doesn't go charging in like a bull. He's just simple little thoughts. Disguise them even with your voice. This is you. Just puts him in. It says about this, about in Scripture about David like that. It talks about Judas like that. It talks about Ananias like that. It says, Satan has filled thy heart. Filled your heart. To believe this. He, he, he persuaded David to number ears when God just told him not to. Persuaded Ananias to lie about his love offerings and his tithes and his gift. He just lied about it. Peter said, why has Satan filled your heart? How do you, how do you get free? There's only one way to be free. Jesus said, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. If all this does is sits by your bed or on your coffee table, then you're not going to be free. Greatest thing anybody ever told me, Joe, memorize the Word of God. Read it, memorize it, memorize it, memorize it. You want to be free? Start memorizing Scripture. You'll be free. It's the power of God's nature is set free in you when you start participating in these precious promises. Freedom for the Christian is a reality. We don't have to be bound by the same old, same old stuff all the time. You can be free. You can be free. Here's your homework assignment. Read Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8. And then, I want you to memorize. Well, I can't memorize anything. There you go again. You believed a lie. What's your name? Joe Arms. Well, you memorize that. 
What's your driver's license? You memorize. What's your social security number? What's your address? What's your zip code? 77388. Okay, I guess you can memorize. All right? It's just that you've been too lazy to memorize. You're going to read in Romans chapter 6, 7, 8, but I want you to look back at Romans chapter 6 after you read it all and read that one more time. And something on that page that you need is going to come off that page. It's just going to stand up. You ever had that experience before reading scripture on something? Somebody just stands up. And you say, well, that was for me. Something's going to stand up on that page. That's the verse I want you to memorize. And they say, well, I already memorized that one. You can go to the next one he shows you. Memorize it. Write it down. Write it down several times. Take it, put it on a card, put it in your pocket, you know. That's one of the things that helps with just overcoming the, the, the cigarette thing, the addiction of that, which is I'd, I'd take verses, and I'd smoke verses, you know. So, you smoke? No, not really, you know. I didn't inhale them, you know. Do you know the truth? To set you free, you know. <laughs> Exhale. Just, I, I put it in my pocket and just memorize scriptures that were related to my need and what I was dealing with. Just memorize that verse, write it down, memorize it, and then you all know my email address, pastorjoe at bfchurch.com. That's real hard. Pastorjoe at bfchurch.com. Send me. Type it out in your little email address there. Send me the, ad- the, the verse that God put on your heart to memorize. And everybody that sends me one, you'll get a year's free supply. No. <laughs> You'll be free. You'll find freedom. But it's also something powerful in sharing what God tells us. So share it with me. I'll rejoice and I'll pray with you and thank God for what God did showing you in your heart. Now, okay, let me ask you a simple question. How many do that? How many are just going to ignore that? How many say, yeah, I'll do that. I'll read six, seven, eight, and I'll pick something out of six that God leads me to memorize. And I'll say, I'll email it to you. And if you don't have email, write it on a piece of paper and put it on my desk. Give Stacy, she'll get it to my mailbox. Amen? So, are you free? Yes, you are in Christ. Well, I want to be. No, you already are. Walk in the freedom that God has given you. Praise God. Let's say a word of prayer, and then I think Don's got some closing announcements. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for this.